I was getting a little distracted on the For Me to Live song because I got to thinking that's uh, a lot of times when they have a scripture song, it's based on the King James Version. I thought, I wonder if we're going to have trouble memorizing that one when you get to it. So I was checking on the phone what the New American was. And it's the same. So we're okay for that verse. You've already got a verse of Philippians 1 memorized, and you didn't even know it. All right, just If we could just sing, you know, actually, uh, putting things to music is a very good way to memorize. We uh, had a professor in college who... Uh, uh, certain types of nouns have different uses and you have to, and there's a long list, like the, the genitive case, that's where you say of Christ or of something. Uh, it has many uses. Sometimes it's possessive. Uh, sometimes uh, it, uh, it is subjective. Sometimes it's objective. Anyway, he created a song. of There's like 15, 19 uses and we had a song for all those uses and we could memorize it and the guys that were in the other classes, they used to laugh at us, but we did better on the test. So, all right, so there you go. So, uh, so if you just put, so what I'm saying is just put Philippians 1 to music and you'll be good, all right? We just need somebody to help us with that. Okay, so Philippians 1, we're in chapter, uh, we're in verses 9 through 13 tonight. We finished the first bit, and uh, the, the epistle opened with a greeting from Paul and Timothy, then a prayer of thanksgiving. For the Philippians, and really it's, it's called that, but it's actually, it's more of a summary of Paul's sentiments and exp expressing those things uh, uh, in the, I don't word that right, that in the Philippians, I got an extra Paul in there. Those things in the Philippians that Paul thanks God for. So you see my notes, there's an error in my notes. Anyway, so now he's going to continue and he actually has a prayer. The very next few verses is called, uh, the prayer of sanctification, and then he's going to be talking about the progress of his imprisonment. So let's read these section by section, and then we'll uh, talk about the content. So we're in verses 8 through 11 right now, or 9 through 11, sorry. We ended up at uh, verse 8 last time. 9 through 11, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of this righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So this I'm calling this the prayer for sanctification. And I have a quote from Constable to start off with. He says, We may not be able to fully explain why God has ordained prayer as a vehicle whereby he works in the world, or exactly how prayer works. Nevertheless, Scripture is unmistakably clear that prayer does affect objective change. And this is a great mystery, and we could go off on that and talk about that a lot, but Paul, we, we know that God knows all things. He knows the, the future as well as the past. He knows every detail about existence. He knows how things will be. He knows the choices that people will make. And yet he calls on us to pray to him. And it seems that somehow those prayers have effect. That's the lesson we get from the scriptures. And how can that be when God knows all these things? Nobody knows. We don't understand it. But that's what the Bible calls us to do, and that's why we pray. Anyway, so I thought that was a good quote. I thought we'd start, that with, start this section with that. But the request is made, abounding love. Verse 9, this I pray that your love may abound. So abounding love. And uh, there's, uh, as far as what is love, what is he praying for in a Christian when you're calling for praying that love might abound in a Christian while well, you're praying for a fruit of the Spirit? It's the first uh, item listed in the uh, fruit of the Spirit list in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It starts there with love. And the, it is a, uh, the, the word fruit in Galatians 5 is singular. It, the verb is singular, and then it has all these things. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, and so forth. But it starts with love. And then we see that love enables the proper exercise of all spiritual gifts. So 1 Corinthians 13, we are fairly familiar with the famous bit where it talks about what love is, or charity as the King James calls it. 
uh, in uh, verse 8, uh, charity suffers long, charity doesn't envy, so on and so forth. But the first three verses of that chapter are very important. If I give all my goods to feed the poor and I do not have love, it profits me nothing, he says. And there's, I forget the, all the other, uh, the three different things that he talks about there. But the point is there, as he's talking about things that we might do in our spiritual lives, but if we do not have love, those, those works that we do for God, those gifts that we exercise, are not effective. So Paul lays that out for us. And so love enables the proper exercise of all spiritual gifts. So Paul prays that they would continue to abound in love. And then love completes the unity of the Spirit within the church in Colossians uh, 3. And you can read those references. I just put those in there. The commentaries mentioned them. I thought they gave a good summary of what it is that he's praying for, what, is, what he wants them to abound in, to abound in love. And there is a key to this in knowledge and all discernment. In knowledge and all discernment. When we say, uh, I'm praying that you will just love more. We're not talking that you'll be more sentimental. It's not a prayer that we be more emotional, right? Uh, there is emotion in love. There is sentiment in love. But that is not the focus. The focus here is in knowledge and discernment. Intelligent insight, I put into the notes. Um, uh, Homer Kent, he said, uh, said on this, spiritual knowledge gained from an understanding of divine revelation enables the believer to love what God commands and in the way he reveals. So, so abounding in love, this love that we're talking about that energizes spiritual gifts and promotes the unity of the spirit is not just a, a kind of sentimentality that overlooks all wrongs and we're just all one happily family, family and can't we all just get along. But it is a love that loves what God loves. It loves righteousness, it loves holiness, it loves uh, faithfulness, it loves the qualities of God, it loves the things of God, it loves the word of God, it loves the people of God. And so it is a thinking love. It's not just a feeling love. And it's not saying there is no feeling, but we want to note that he qualifies it or energizes it by this, this phrase, I pray that your love may abound still more and more, in real knowledge and discernment. So you're not, it's a discriminating love as well in discernment. We'll talk a little bit more about discernment in the next little bit. But we're really trying to zero in. What's he praying for? He's praying for the kind of love that promotes healthy Christian life. So in a church, like we try to promote love in our church, and we don't all agree on everything. I've noticed that. You know, we don't have to agree on everything, and uh, you um, and and we can, we don't expect you to agree on everything, but we do expect you to love the thing God, things God loves, and we expect you to love the uh, what's right, and we expect you to be able to look at our world and say, well, wait a minute, that particular activity or that particular philosophy is not consistent with the Word of God. I can't love that, right? So we make there's discrimination and discernment in love. All right, so, and he does talk about discernment in verse 10, so that you may approve the things that are excellent. So the first objective of this prayer is that you would have increased discernment. Clearly, sanctification means discerning between good and evil. All right, so there are some things that are evil we should not do. There are some things that are good that we should do, right? Or we should incorporate in our lives. But sanctification also means discerning value. Does this choice edify or not? There are things that we do that are not wrong in themselves, but they may not do much to edify us. And we have to wrestle through some of those things. You know, we, uh, there's many Christians, I am afraid, who are caught up in all the entertainment of the world or all the activities of the world, and it the things they're doing, you couldn't point and say, well, that's actually wrong. You couldn't actually say, there's something evil about that. But the problem is that it has become, it can become an idol that takes their attention away from God, or at, at best, you could be spending your time on something better. And we're not calling for people to be, you know, super serious, 
uh, you know, we no fun, we're not allowed to have fun. We're not saying that, okay, I hope you get that. But we do, discernment means approving the things that are excellent. What are the things that are best? Does this choice edify or not? Will I grow towards God or remain static if I take part in this activity? And again, I'm, I'm not saying, like there is sort of this caricature of a, of a, Christian who emphasizes holiness and righteousness and so forth, that they're, you know, they're, they're no fun Christians, right? They're, they don't want to have any fun. All they do is let's sing hymns and read the Bible all day long. That's, that's a caricature. Well, <clears throat> there's probably some Christians that misunderstand what this is saying. But there are way more Christians who say, oh, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I can do what I want. And that <laughs> love... Approve, it involves improving things that are excellent, this sanctifying love. So, uh, who is this one? N number three, this is Constable. The things that we choose because we love them reflect how discerning our love really is. The things we choose because we love them reflect how discerning our love really is. So there's certain things we will choose to do, and it shows that we love that thing. You do the things you like. Mostly, right? Um, and so you show what you love when you do that. And you can uh, have a th right theology and say all the right words scripturally, but you can live in a way that says, I, I like to have that public face, but I like to live the way I want. So approving things that are excellent. All right, but then, so increased discernment, the objective is increased discernment, then complete sanctification. At the end of verse 10, it says, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Now, the day of Christ is the judgment seat of Christ, the coming of the Lord. Okay, this is when we answer to the Lord. And so his objective, really, this would be his objective for our sanctification in our life, that when we come to that point, that we can stand before the Lord and there is no blame that attaches to us. That we've walked with God all these years. That we've been faithful servants of God. And that we haven't served ourselves or we haven't served idols. We haven't served the things of the world. But we're, that we are um, without blame, sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. And it says also, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which we get, which comes through Jesus Christ. So, it's, it's not our works that make us righteous, and it's not our great sterling qualities, but what he wants our love to be directed towards, our sanctification to be directed towards, is the kind of spirit that is just constantly trying to get closer to God, and God is working in our lives, and his work is showing th through in our lives. And so it closes to the glory and praise of God. That's what our life is about. And there are things, yeah, there's things that are fun to do. And, and it's okay, I think, once in a while to, you know, do things uh, that you like that are not sinful. Like, I, I think I like to go, I used to like to go to hockey games. All right. I always mention hockey. It's my, it is my one vice. I guess I'm feeling convicted because we spent so much time on it this spring with the Oilers being in the finals. Okay, but but you know it's okay. I used to like to go to games. Nowadays, there's so much terrible music at the games. I'd rather watch it on TV. But I think it's okay to do that to a certain extent. But it, I want to show that I love God more than I love that. So that's maturity. That's sanctification. So in our prayers for others, he's praying for these people. In our prayers for others, we should especially pray for God's work in their life. Now, we have on our list, we have people who need salvation, and certainly we want them to be saved. We have people who need physical healing, and, and they have a need. Okay, And that's, that's all right to pray for. But it is a momentary affliction, but everybody needs spiritual healing and growth. Everybody needs that. And even those that we're praying for, even more than their physical healing, they need to grow in their suffering. And maybe God is allowing that, that suffering for that purpose, and so we should also pray that the Lord would help them to grow 
and become what God wants him to be. All right, so the prayer for sanctification. That's these three verses. And then the progress of Paul's imprisonment. All right, so this is a very interesting passage. So he talks, well, let's read the whole thing, I, verse 12 to 18. And there is, uh, you'll see in my Bible, there's a division actually after verse 20. Some outlines divide it different ways. It's a little hard to divide this up, but I didn't want to, I had to stop somewhere. So we're stopping in verse 18. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known through the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. And then, I actually think there's a division here. The yes, and I will rejoice. And you'll see, if you've got a Bible laid out like mine, that is connected to the next verse. There's a paragraph there in the middle of verse 18. But anyway, he will, re he will rejoice. So the progress of Paul's imprisonment. You know, the, you know at the end of the book of Acts, he was in prison and in Rome, and he's in a rented house, and so he's under custody. And, uh, he, and he, there is one commentator suggests that perhaps he had been moved. There's no indication uh, uh, in this uh, exactly, but he's, perhaps that the Philippians had heard that Paul had been moved from the rented house into a more secure location pending his trial before Nero. Okay, so that's possible, but that's not necessarily what the text is saying. Regardless, he's in prison. And you know, here he is, this preacher of the gospel. He's traveled all over the Mediterranean to preach the gospel, starting churches, winning people to Christ, appointing elders, doing many great works for God, and now he's in jail. And he's been in jail for, at this point, probably about four or five years. You know, for a missionary to be in jail for four or five years, that would be sort of Hard to take, don't you think? Why am I here? Has God forgotten me? But what is Paul saying? He's saying, you know, you might think this is bad. It's actually good. Look what God's been able to do. So he gives us these things here. Um, oh, I have a quote here from Warren Wearsby that I thought was good. The same God who uses Moses' rod and Gideon's pitchers and David's sling used Paul's chains. That's what he said. I thought that was good. All right, so what happened? So the spread of the gospel in Nero's Rome. So here he is. He's a very important prisoner. A big question has been raised with his imprisonment involving religious matters and relations between Jews and Rome and all this. And uh, the Praetorian guards were the elite troops guarding the emperor, guarding the city of Rome, and important prisoners. They were, a high, from what I understand, the highest paid soldiers in the Roman army. They were basically the police force of Rome. They had a, there was a camp outside of the city that was their headquarters. Now, it doesn't say that he was in that camp, but it, he is under their guard. And guess so? Paul has people come visit him. We see that at the end of the book of Acts. He has Jews come visit him. He has Christians come visit him. He has other people come visit him, and he's preaching the gospel. And there's guys next to him, chained to him, 24 hours a day, two guys, and they're hearing this preaching, and they can't leave. 24 hours a day. Every eight hours, another one comes on, right? Here they are. Paul's preaching. So guess what happens? They go back and tell everybody else, this guy, you wouldn't believe this guy that we've got in, we're guarding. And they'll switch off, and there's somebody else comes in, and, they, oh, I, and they're, they're hearing the gospel, and some of them are getting saved. That's what's happening. Through their constant guard, the cause of Christ became known to them and to everyone else, it says. Kent again says, uh, Paul was able to get the gospel out from inside prison walls. And so everyone else includes quite a few people. 
uh, the Jews that came to him, the Christians that came to him, others that visitors, official visitors, uh, probably, I don't know if there were legal visitors, but there were people who knew about him. Now, there's some indication, I think, from this, that even as far as the palace, they knew about this case and what this guy claimed. And we're pretty sure that he, his case was tried before Nero. There's nothing in the Bible that says that, but just the indication of the importance of his, prisoner, of his imprisonment. He had appealed to Caesar. He was tried before Nero. You know the reputation of Nero, how wicked he was, how he ended up committing suicide at the end. But he heard the gospel from the Apostle Paul. And there were people there who heard from him uh, the gospel. Some of those people in the emperor's palace were likely Christians. I'll take questions at the end, so just don't, uh, don't mind. I'm going to keep going. Okay, so now, um, but there's not only that. Okay, so he's had this. He's, he said, look at all the people I'm talking to. Not only that, the, our believers here, most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Isn't that amazing? They, they hear that, oh, here's our leading apostle. He's, he's a prisoner. And here he's coming to Rome and oh, things are bad, but he keeps preaching. And they see the results and they say, well, we might as well preach too. And so they are gaining courage and they are speaking positively. I put in my notes there a phrase that came from one of our professors. The positive faith attitude, he said. That's what you need to have. Paul abounded in positive faith, which produced positive faith in other people. So his, his view was, here's an opportunity. I'm not going to let an opportunity go to waste. I'm in jail. That doesn't matter. Preach to the guards. I'll preach to whoever comes and visits. And I'll tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we have something else in this letter that is a paradox, a paradox of conflict. He says, he acknowledges, verse 16, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. So there's two kinds of people who are responding to Paul's preaching, some in a negative kind of way, and others from a positive kind of way. So there's an admission here of conflict. Some preach Christ from envy and strife. Some preach Christ from goodwill. What are their motivations? The positive one is they did it out of love. Verse 16, the latter do it out of love, knowing I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. These are friends of Paul, and they are preaching out of love for God, love for Paul. And they're encouraged by what Paul is doing. But others, out of selfish ambition... The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So what are they doing? What are these people? Now, some people have thought these were Judaizers. Now, Paul does condemn Judaizers later on in the epistle, chapter 3, verse 2, for example. But these are not Judaizers. The Judaizers were heretics. Paul condemns heretics. These people are preaching the true Christ. Apparently, they're preaching the true gospel. But what is the problem? They want to be seen as leading voices in the Roman church, is what I think they are. They don't really like Paul. They feel like Paul, I mean, he, yeah, he's a big name, but I mean, he's always getting in trouble, and he's in jail, and why don't people listen to me more? And so they're out there preaching and trying to gather crowds preaching the true gospel, but underlying their preaching is this motive, was we're trying to stick it to Paul, to show them that we are good preachers too, that we have ability too. So what does Paul say about them? Um, he, says, he says, praise the Lord, the gospel's being preached. So they're preaching the true gospel. I want you to be clear on that, but they're doing it out of envy. Now, I have a little note here. Uh, there is a chiasm in this, and it is quite clear. Now, Con Tom Constable loves chiasms. I, he finds them everywhere in his commentary. This one is absolutely clear. So you notice verse 15a, preaching from en envy. Verse 15b, preaching from goodwill. And then, then the contrast, preaching out of love, and then working back out of the outline, preaching out of selfish ambition. So you see how the outline works? 
the emphasis. And because of that, you remember the focal point of a chiasm is the center point. It's the most important part of that kind of structure. And the most important thing is preaching the true gospel out of love. Right? Out of a real love for God and a love for the word of God and a love for uh, the gospel that you're preaching. Okay? So anyway, just a little interesting thing there. Uh, Debbie's not here. She's supposed to be writing all the questions. So I don't know if she'll, she'll have to watch this or read the notes. <laughs> Maybe you'll get quizzed on that. I don't know. Okay, something worth knowing. And so what is Paul's response? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. So Paul's indifference to the badly motivated adds to the notion that they are not Judaizers. Okay. Uh, and I have a note here, the last one from Kent says, although pretense has the sense of pretext, pretense, or false motives, it does not necessarily imply that they were antagonistic preachers, that the antagonistic preachers did not believe that what they were preaching, but that their preaching was a pretext to cover other less worthy purposes. So, so they had at least as part of their motivation that we want to sort of show Paul that we're as good as he is, or something like that. Something like that. The important thing, however, is the preaching of Christ, which increased in Rome because of Paul's imprisonment. So therefore, Paul rejoices. Now, we live in a city where there's many different kinds of churches. We have strong disagreements with some of those churches. Now, they, some of them, even though they disagree with us on style of worship or on some of our theology, some of them are truly preaching the gospel. Praise the Lord that they are. And for everyone who hears the gospel there and is saved, praise the Lord. So we don't have an exclusive attitude about, you know, we are the best. We all think we're the best, but we're not thinking that, you know, somehow we're, we're looking down on others. There's differences. We, we're trying to follow the Bible as best we can. They have, they have to answer to God. We don't, they don't answer to us. And so praise the Lord when they preach the gospel. Now, of course, there are churches that are like the Judaizers who Paul strongly condemns later on. They preach a false gospel. Well, we would condemn that. You see, there is a difference. So I think it's important to dis make that distinction. All right, so Constable wraps everything up here. This quote. Verses 12 to 18 present Paul as a positive model for all believers. Rather than valuing his own comfort, reputation, and freedom above all else, he put the advancement of God's plan first. He discerned what was best. He could maintain a truly joyful attitude even in unpleasant circumstances because he derived his joy from seeing God glorified rather than from seeing himself exalted. His behavior in prison had been pure and blameless. And so I want to sum up or close with my title. I didn't mention that at the beginning, but my title is Sanctify and Sanctified. Paul prayed that God would sanctify the Philippians. He wanted them to grow spiritually, sanctify. But then Paul tells this report about his own circumstances, and you can see that Paul himself is sanctified, right? Sanctify and sanctified. So Paul is the model for us of where we should be. The things that he's praying for the Philippians are the things that sh we should be asking God to work into our lives and following the model of the Apostle Paul in his life. All right, uh, let's close. I think there was one question at least. So James. Yeah, um, I mean, Paul does it as just speculation, but I'm just wondering if maybe Paul was treated as a more important prisoner because of his previous history of persecuting Christians. Um... Well, maybe by the Jews, but not so much the Romans. They didn't probably care about that that much. So the Jew, back when he was arrested in Jerusalem, they really had it in for him because he was. They would see him as a traitor. Yeah. Right. Right. Not the Romans. Oh, right. Okay. okay. Yeah. So there's a, the Romans. They just wanted them to quit fighting. Okay. And eventually the Jews wouldn't quit, so the Romans came in and destroyed their city. So that's the way it went. All right. Okay. Any other questions or comments you'd like to mention? Okay, so let's have a word of prayer and we'll close for tonight. Our Father, we thank you for this time that we've had in, the, uh, in this evening to study the Philippians. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be um, uh, faithful ourselves to grow, to take in this word, see the example of the Apostle Paul, be that kind of Christian. Lord, that we would 
simply live for your glory and that our lives would reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.